Anyway, today we are going to continue on our little talk about passion and destiny. And the plan is that I'm going to do this week and next week on the seven letters to the seven churches. As part of that, to really develop a degree of passion in us and to give us an understanding of our destiny and where you're going. So to start with, I want to ask you, you know, do you believe, how many of you believe in uh, arranged marriages? How many of you had an arranged marriage? Some of you believed in arranged marriages. You're thinking, is this a trick question? I got to think about this one. How many of you had an arranged marriage? Hands up if you had an arranged marriage. How many arranged by like human beings? <laughs> How many of you felt like, you know, you should have some choice in your spouse? And all the rest of you still don't know what happened, right? <laughs> It's like, I don't know, all of a sudden I was just married and I woke up one morning and look who I'm next to. Uh, <laughs> that kind of happened in the Bible with Jacob, didn't it? It's like, I didn't think I knew that I was getting married to this one, but anyway, this actually is relevant because, uh, because you know, I believe that, that Jesus should have a right to speak into his bride. And that he should have some choice in who he's marrying and he should have the right to be able to speak in the qualities and the characteristics of what he's looking for in his girlfriend and in his wife. Is that good? And in order to, uh, in order to really lay the foundation for that, I want to step us back into the book of Colossians just for a few moments to address why that is. Um, but I want to say too that you know, when we have an understanding of this bridegroom king, the one that has chosen us, the one that loves us exactly the way we are, but loves us too much to leave us the way we are, and that sets things out like he does in the seven letters to the seven churches by essentially raising a standard and raising a bar and saying, this is what I'm looking for in my girlfriend, you know, that perhaps it'll call us higher. You know, we, we've got a choice in our, in our cultures where we've got a lot of people that will that will demonstrate a lifestyle and a reality that will call you lower. And we also have a God that will demonstrate a lifestyle and reality that will call you higher. And as the church of Jesus, we get to choose which way we want to go. And I would suggest that we look at coming higher and that we don't compare ourselves with those people around us or the church down the street or whomever it is, but we begin to recognize in a, in a heartfelt relationship and a walk with the Lord. What is it that you're looking for, Jesus? What are you doing in my life? What do you want to touch inside of me to bring healing and restoration to, to call me to that place that you're, you're really desiring? And so in light of what Jesus is looking for and in light of this bridal paradigm, I, I want you to put on this, these glasses, these lenses that are a, a bridal paradigm set of lenses and uh, you know, I'm going to whip through some of Colossians chapter 1, where the Apostle Paul, who I believe had very much this bridal paradigm, he's saying, we've not ceased to pray for you and ask that you be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And when you think of his will, you think of his desires. How many guys were courageous this past weekend? How many, just give us a shout if you really enjoyed it and you really loved it. Woo! Guys, it was awesome. It was really amazing. A completely different vein than what we've done the last two years. But it started on Friday night with really addressing our desires and the fact that quite often we're unaware of what we really want. What are the deep desires? And we, we react, but at the, at the root of our reaction and of our response, there, there is a desire that is, that is there. And so you got your emotional side and you got your rational side of your mind. But, you know, your rational side, you, 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 you can work on, you can figure out, and you can have some level of control over it, but the emotional tends to be that thing which just jumps out front, and it's all based and rooted in your desires, and so what are the desires of our hearts? And, uh, and begin to identify those, and it releases us forward. As a matter of fact, Edith Verhagen is doing a small group. Are you, Edith? She's doing a connect group really geared to this book called The Invitation by Tony Stoltzfus, who's very much developed this, and Tony's now training uh, life coaching, life coach for many of the staff at Bethel, including Danny Silk, who's brilliant in himself. And so here's this guy who, you know, God has just released and bringing this revelation through some of his own story, and it's amazing. Edith says she loves it, and I think we need to get that book. I don't know if Tammy's here. I would have called for Christine earlier, but Tammy to say we got to order that book, The Invitation. So we're going to get it in our bookstore. And, but 
you know, understanding our desires. These are the desires, you know, that Paul is praying that we be filled with the knowledge of his will, that we be filled with the desires of what Jesus wants with all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that we can walk worthy or walk in a manner that's worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every work, in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. You know, when you've got a healthy marriage, you want, to, you want to bear fruit that pleases your spouse. And wives, you want to bear fruit that pleases your husband. And church, we want to bear fruit that pleases our bridegroom king. In the knowledge of God, we want to be strengthened with power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father. That there's so much joy. You know, one of the hallmarks of a healthy marriage is joy. You know, and one of the hallmarks of an unhappy marriage is discouragement and depression and a heavy weight on you. And I want to say to you that there's life and there's hope and there's joy and there's love and it's absolutely awesome. But the Father begins to speak to us about his son Jesus, about the one that you and I are betrothed to. And really we're betrothed at the Last Supper where Jesus said, and this what when we take communion, we think of this bridal paradigm. Jesus said, I have longed, you know, I've earnestly desired with, an, with a deep desire is what Jesus is saying. One of two times that he redressed that, the desire in the New Testament. He says, I've earnestly longed for and earnestly desired with a deep desire to share this Passover with you. And what was it? There's this cup. There's this cup of, of betrothal, really. And, and we need to, you know, I'm not going to go into the depths of it now, but we should someday, maybe around Passover season. But if there's a longing where at the end of, uh, of it, he's saying, and I'm not going to drink again of this cup until I drink it anew with you in the kingdom that's to come. And so Jesus is also earnestly desiring to return for that, that wedding feast and for that bridal feast with a bride. And so there's a passion that burns in his heart for you and I, but as he's drinking this cup, he knows that there's a time coming where he's going to drink it anew and it's going to be the fulfillment and the consummation of the bridal feast and the wedding feast. And so he's really longing for us as the bride to prepare ourselves and to make ourselves ready, even as he's making ready a home for us and a place for us in the Father's presence so that when he comes, you know, there's going to be, it's just all going to be prepared. He's going to be prepared, we're going to be prepared, and we're going to enter into this, this phase of life as the, as the bride of Christ with all that that entails and with all that means. And so it's joyous. And so the Father is, is saying to us, listen, I've, I've, I've rescued you, or sorry, Jesus has rescued us from the domain of darkness. He's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus is the image of of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He's before all things, in him all things hold together, and he's also the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place or preeminence in everything. And so the Father's bragging on Jesus. He's saying that he's going to have first place in everything. He will be preeminent. He is going to be chief among 10,000. He's going to be glorious among anything glorious. He will be the very center and the focus of all existence on the earth and on the planet. It, the Father is extolling the worth and the value of his son Jesus. But he's also saying, you know, that's why Paul is praying that we're ready, that we're prepared for this wedding feast and this bridal feast. And so in that, in the context of understanding that Jesus is to have preeminence in absolutely everything, then we would want to say, well, then Jesus, when you are looking for your bride and when you are longing and calling a bride for yourself, as you look out on the field, if I can put it that way, and choose what are you looking for in the woman or the bride, the one that will be by your side to rule and reign with you, just like Adam was looking for somebody to reign over the Garden of Eden in his season and felt like he had nobody for a season until Eve came along. And so it's the very similar way that he's doing this, that Jesus is longing for that. And you and I are part of that equation. Isn't that great? We have an invitation. And yet... The seven letters to the seven churches are really part of the, the, uh, the command or the exhortation to you and I to prepare ourselves and to make ourselves ready. 
as we begin to understand the big picture. Now, in one level, it's one message to seven churches. In one level, it's seven messages to seven churches. And very much, it was a historical reality that these things really happened within those churches in that season of time approximately 2,000 years ago. But it also speaks to us today because the whole book of Revelation reveals that it is that those of us that read it and heed it, um, so read it or hear it or heed it, will be blessed. And then as we begin to walk in it, and so I'm not going to get into Revelation, but I'm going to get into the first few chapters because it's a preparation for what he's looking for, and it's a preparation so that you and I can be prepared for this incredible transition of the ages, that we will be a passionate bride, and that we will be a prepared bride, ready for him, and an overcoming bride, that we begin to overcome the things and the obstacles that will come our way as there's a preparation for the return of Jesus. And so really, these seven letters to the seven churches are an incredible gift to us. But will we open the gift? Will we unwrap the gift? Will we begin to look at what's in there? You know, I find it fascinating that we as people tend to be caught up and so fascinated with Disney. You know, you look at all the Disney stories, you look at everything, you know, where the theme of the story is, is that there's a handsome, dashing prince who you know, grows up and sets his eyes on this incredible, uh, beautifully, beautiful looking princess, but inevitably the princess ends up you know, going into some level of exile because she's captured by somebody bad, the bad guy, and, and it's the prince's job to come and rescue the princess. And at the end of the day, you know, he takes her to himself, they get married, they live in their print, they live in their castle, and they end up ruling a kingdom and they live happily ever after. And you wonder, why are we so fascinated with that? I believe it's because it's our story. That's our story. We're, we're in that story. And Disney just happened to capture it. And, and he, he made it palatable so that we would enjoy it and the kids would enjoy it. And so, you know, I mean, even Shrek is like that. You know, you got them all, Cinderella and Shrek and Sleeping Beauty, The Littlest Mermaid, Belle, Cin you know, Pocahontas. Nala, you know, the Lion King, Mary Poppins, the list goes on, right? And we're captivated by these things because it's our story. And if we realize it's our story, then we may as well enjoy it, right? Let's get into it. You know, we can, we can watch it or we can get into it and get involved in the very thick of it. And we can be passionate about it because we realize that that's our destiny that's all wrapped up inside of there. And so... Looking at it another way, I would say these seven letters to the seven churches are also like what we see in the wall there. It's an ark. Scripture says that as in the days of Noah, so will the days of the coming of the Son of Man be. And guys, we're getting close. I mean, he's, he's right around the corner. But as, as we know from the story of Noah, you know, it's great how it's such a great kid story. But in the end, it was, it was all about God rescuing his people and calling for some people that would be wholehearted and would give everything to him and would love him wholeheartedly so that they could start all over in a kingdom. And those that didn't want anything to do with him didn't have to. And they were essentially removed from the earth. And so you and I, in the seven letters to the seven churches, have access to the ark. We can get on the ark and be in a place of safety and be in a place of learning what it is to overcome all the things and the waves and the wild tossing of the sea that comes our way. And so how do you get on the ark? I believe that in part you get on the ark by reading the word, but the seven letters to the seven churches are the ark. And so let's see a little bit more about what our bridegroom, who he is and what he says. And, and so turn with me if you have your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. And I don't know if you've got that, uh, you know, if you've got the PowerPoint, Tim, if it was able to work, you can put that first one up there if you want. Um, and uh, anyway, the, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? It's the, the revelation means apocalypse or unveiling. Essentially, it's an unveiling. It's beginning to reveal who he is. You know, we, we, get, we think we know who Jesus is because we read the Gospels. And that's a really great picture of who Jesus is. But there's an aspect of him that's revealed even more in the seven churches. And, uh, and it goes on. It says, blessed are those that read and hear the words of the prophecy. Heed the things that are in it. And it goes on, refers to Jesus as the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. And the Father says, behold, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. 
And meanwhile, here's John who's writing it. He's saying, I, John, fellow partaker in the tribulation in the kingdom and the perseverance which are in Jesus. You know, our, our theme for the month is about passion. You can take it off now, Tim. Uh, the next slide, I'll let you know soon. It's about passion. And even the last number of days before Christ went to the cross was called The Passion of the Christ. The movie that Mel Gibson did is The Passion of the Christ. There's an element of passion that is partly the suffering. It's the suffering of the Christ to prepare for what's ready. And so John here is saying, you know, that I am a partaker in the tribulation. The day that this book was written, even the seven letters to the seven churches, God was preparing John to speak to those seven churches in regard or in the context of the tribulation. Now, I would say that here in Canada, we're blessed. You know, North America, we're blessed. We really are. But, you know, we prayed for France earlier. We prayed for Paris earlier. It's like, wow, what is going on there? You know, you, there's a lot of nations in the world. The Middle East, the level of persecution that's beginning to rise is very physical. It is very in your face, and it's very real. For us, it's a different type of story, and I'll, I'll maybe get into that in a little bit of time. But, you know, the Lord is speaking to John, gives him this encounter where he's saying, I want you to, to, to write the things that you hear, and he says, I want you to send them to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, if you can put up that map again. And so those, those are real places that are going to be shown on the map. They're all in the province of Asia at that point in time, and they're all very close to one another. It's modern-day Turkey. And I believe, even in light of that, that we're going to see an incredible move of the Spirit in the natural in Turkey. Right? There's, they're, they're going to come in in droves, I believe. And it's, it's a nation to watch right now as we look at the face of the earth. But God is calling a bride from every tribe, tongue, and nation of the world. And so here's all these different cities that were, for whatever reason, sovereignly chosen by God to say, speak to them. And I believe in part it's because what is being released to these churches is practical for all of us at all time. You know, if there were several thousand believers at that point in time that it was written to, you know, or tens of thousands, there's like millions, tens of millions, and billions even today that are able to take note by the things that were spoken in that day and age. And so you can, you can let that slide go. And so, you know, it goes on, this voice that was speaking to John, you know, he says, I saw seven golden lampstands. And so these are descriptions that will be referred to in the seven letters. The different descriptions of Jesus were, it may seem very mysterious, but they're referred to specifically where there's an attribute of Christ that is very helpful based on the context or the situation of every individual church. And so God is speaking to that church based on a character or an aspect of the nature of God. I would say similar to the way that in 1994, God reveals himself to us as Father as Papa, that has revolutionized the way we think, the way we do things, because we know who he is as Father. But in similar ways, he reveals certain aspects of Jesus to the different churches that are important. And so we will get into that uh, this week, next week, um, you know, for part two as we continue on. But uh, he goes on and he, he, and he says that um, in the middle of the man's lamp stands, I saw one like a son of man clothed in a robe reaching to the feet, girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it's been made to glow in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of many waters, and in his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in its strength. And John says, I fell at his feet like a dead man. But, but Jesus says, don't be afraid, I'm the first and the last. The living one, I was dead, behold, I'm alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and of Hades. And then he says, write these things that are going to take place. They're going to take place really shortly. And so let's begin to dig into these, these prophecies uh, a little bit more. I want to increase the level of context. But again, I believe that they apply to us today because, first of all, it's a revelation of Jesus. I would say you and I will do very well to, to dig into who Jesus is. We had a conversation in our pastor's meeting the other night about our theme for the new year, and I won't give it away just yet, but there's a lot of reference to Jesus and how we're going to go about it because there's descriptions of him and in, in what we want to bring forth. And, and anybody that's about to get married, you want to know who you're going to marry. Yes? No surprises would be really nice in a marriage. Agreed? And so some of you are laughing, some of you are groaning. <clears throat> And so let's take the time, 
you know, to get to know who we're going to marry for all of eternity. Because your current marriage is going to, you know, Scripture makes it clear, once we're done here in the earth, that one's, that one's over. You're not going to be married to your spouse in the resurrection. Okay, and some of you cheer and some of you groan again. <laughs> um, so, but again, understand that, that we want to know who he is and, and that as we get to, to know him, I believe that even that is our ark. Even getting to know him is the very thing that, that he will draw us unto himself so that we get on the ark. We've got a place of safety for the, that takes place. And so we want to apply these seven letters in four different ways, primarily. For us, we want to apply them individually because I believe it will, it will bring forth wholeheartedness. You know, it's, it is easy to get so caught up in busyness that, that our hearts grow dull. I mean, I, I feel like I'm victim, guilty as charged right here. Okay, I, there's this call to, to, to regain wholeheartedness from the place of half-heartedness. Not that I choose half-heartedness, but I find myself drawn into it at different times. And so the standard is high. You know, the standard is very high when we read these seven letters. We also want to look at it historically, that they were first written to those seven, le- those seven churches. They were accurate. They really happened. There really were seven churches. But there's, there's parallels to the spiritual conditions between those churches and, this, and our church, meaning the global church of 2015 and 16. We want to realize that they're, they're um, applied universally, meaning to all sorts of local churches all across the world, right? And they're also applied eschatol- es- Scatologically, meaning for, you know, as we prepare ourselves for the end of the age. I'm not going to focus on that part so much today. And so we realize that the seven letters carry a pattern. You know, apart from the fact that they name a church and every time through, they give an attribute uh, or a title or an attribute of Christ specific to that church, which was referred to in John chapter 1. But they specifically talk about a, a particular church and give that attribute to them that will help them. Meaning that if a church is in the doldrums or in a, in a quandary or in a, in a rut, Jesus reveals himself in a certain way to strengthen them and help them get out of that rut and get to the other side. And so it's helpful for us to know that. There's also, uh, and so it's, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's an aspect that, that also will help them, by the way, to overcome uh, temptations or overcome persecution. To just get you out of that place of getting out of the rut. There's also a commendation to the, to the specific church in most cases. Some churches did not get any level of accolade or they didn't get any, any affirmation for faithfulness, but some did. And so it, it's like report card. You know, how many remember report card with great joy? How many remembered report card day with great sorrow? You needed inner healing sessions for it. You know, give me an RTF or a sozo because I've... Got deep inner healing needs from report card time. And so in some of those churches, the Lord really highlights them and says, listen, you have done very, very well in these areas. And I don't want to hear that. I I do want to hear that. Don't you want to hear what you've done well? You know, in, in any marriage, you know, it's great husbands and wives to speak to each other and tell them what you feel really, what you so appreciate about the other. Right? What you value, what you highly honor. But Jesus is essentially saying, this touches my heart when you do this in what you've done. You know, I'm blessed and I'm so encouraged and, and I will remember it. And it means something to me. And so well done and thank you for being so faithful in those particular areas. Jesus is our bridegroom. The next thing that he goes into is the concern about that church or where they're corrected for degrees of compromise or corrected for something within the church. You know, and and how many like to be corrected here? Hands up high. You know, I I just want to be corrected well. Okay? But sometimes I wonder, is it it better to not be corrected or or to just be corrected poorly? I don't know. (laughs) Because if you don't know what what you don't know, it's kind of tough as you keep living. And, you know, I I believe if you're going to, let me say this, if you're going to correct anybody on anything... Do it well. Do it well. Right? I mean, honor the value of the person in front of you. And also, understand the the condition of your relational bank account with that person. If you haven't put any deposits into that person's life, don't be taking withdrawals out thinking you've got the right to correct them. Right? Make sure that that person knows that you love them and that you poured into them in so many ways so that you've earned the right to speak into their life. 
And then even there, it might be perceived for a season as a withdrawal on that relational bank account, but in the end, you know, it should be something that you're thankful for, because I'm sure we can all say that we recognize times where somebody rebuked us or corrected us, and we weren't too happy about it at the time. But, you know, after a few weeks or months or years, in some cases, we actually said, you know, it was really good. I really appreciated that. And so Jesus brings correction for different levels of compromise. And the big things that he brings correction for are immorality, idolatry, um, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I'll get into uh, next week, Lord willing, leaving their first love, having a name of being spiritual, spiritually alive when they're actually spiritually dead. You know, that'd be a tough one to take, wouldn't it? As well as lukewarmness. You know, those are the areas where, you know, passivity. It's one of, it's one of our, one of the authentic manhood definitions that we've taken in Courageous is the first thing as guys that we want to do is reject passivity. Can I say that I believe the Lord, as I read scripture, the Lord is harder on passivity than he is on us going out there and doing the best we can with what we've got, but at least giving it the good old college try. You know, it's when we sit back and do nothing that, you know, beware. Like, guys, I, I don't think there's any room in the kingdom of God to do nothing. Now, you don't, what you do, you don't do for the love of God. You do from the love of God. You do because you're so overwhelmed and grateful for all that he's done for you that you want to get out there and serve and you just give it your best. And so wherever it is, the one in front of you, you, you want to pour out love because you've got his love to pour in you and through you and to others. And so don't be passive. Reject passivity, whether you're a man or a woman here. Right? Don't let it happen because even the parable of the talents, you know, at least, you know, Jesus said to that last guy, even if you'd have put it in the bank, you would have collected interest. But because you just buried it, you wicked, evil, lazy servant. Right? That's pretty harsh correction, isn't it? I'm sure he did it with the Father's love. <laughs> but I don't want to be on the other end of that. I, I want to at least, I want to go for it. And so there is levels where a couple churches didn't receive any correction from Jesus. And uh, those are Smyrna and Philadelphia, by the way. Um, and, uh, you know, but that, that's because they're probably doing pretty good. Well, they did, actually. They did quite well. And the other thing, the, the fifth thing that you see in, in pretty much all the seven letters is an exhortation to respond to what God is saying. You know, when God speaks to you, is it possible he wants us to respond? He wants us to pay attention to what he's saying so that we can get out there and do something about it? I've heard Patricia say many times, you know, if you, if you can't hear God, maybe it's because you didn't respond to the last thing he told you. And so let's, let's get out there and, and respond. Let's rectify the situation. Let's Let's collectively or individually do what we can to rise up and to be the kind of girlfriend he wants us to be, to be the bride that he desires. Because again, it's, it's not a thing of control, all right? Sometimes in a, in a human marriage and relationship, it can come across like control. In this case, he's worthy. He's given us everything. He gave everything for you. There's nothing he held back for you, his bride. And so our response also needs to be, we, we will give you everything in response. And if you're calling me higher in this, I wholeheartedly welcome that and I receive it and I welcome you to come and address the issues of my heart because I don't want any compromise. I don't want anything that will grieve your Holy Spirit to take place. And so I believe Jesus is saying, you know, take a stand. I want you to take a stand, even if there's persecution or even if there's temptation, take a stand for you. It really matters. It matters now, and it will matter tomorrow, and it will matter for all of eternity if you take a stand. So be strong. Don't back away from that temptation. The next thing that he talks to all the churches about is the penalty or the result of non-obedience. You know, when they chose to not listen in some cases to the churches, Jesus said, here's what's going to happen if you actually don't pay attention to what I'm telling you. Right? And, and, and you know what? I'd rather know now than in, in the future. I'd rather know now than in eternity. I don't want any surprises when I meet them face to face. I don't know about you. You know, it's like door number one, door number two, or door number three. Which one would you choose? It's not going to work that way. You know, it's going to be a surprise because we, we're given, according to Moses, under the curse, 70 years or 80 if due to strength, but according to not under the curse, 120. I learned that from Kenneth Copeland, right? So let's go for the 120 and, and give it all for him in that case. And so there's, there's penalty 
You know, Thyatira was warned, if you don't pay attention to what I'm trying to tell you as a church that's done really well in some areas, then you got to, you know, then you got to be aware of what's coming. And in some cases, I think it's just the enemy coming in because he's got a legal right to come in and bring destruction. And the last thing Jesus does is he talks about the promise or the reward of overcoming the obstacle that's currently in our way. And again, this is to us as individuals, but I believe it's to us as a church. You know, it's about catch the fire. Let's take it seriously for us corporately. And so we want to be equipped to stand under the place of pressure. You know, I want to know that he's with me and he's for me and he's cheering me on. And, and I love the fact that there's eternal rewards. He's actually saying there's things that I'm going to give you to him who overcomes or her who overcomes. You know, they're going to be allowed to do da 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 and all these great things that they're going to be given. Now, it's interesting because Jesus taught these eternal rewards more than anybody else in Scripture. Paul alluded to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But Jesus was speaking to those, and when you think eternal rewards, he was already speaking to those that had received the free gift of salvation. Don't confuse the two. You're not, you're, you're not working for your salvation. You've already received it. It was a free gift. Jesus paid it all. He was the one that was considered worthy so that you were able to come in and receive. And so, you know, our, our works are critical. Our works and our deeds. Works is not a dirty word. It means that the time, the money, the energy that you give and you contribute, it really matters. It means when you give your tithes and your offerings and you give to the poor that come around you, he sees it. It matters. He knows. It means that when you give a cup of cold water to somebody in the name of Jesus, it matters. And he sees it, and he wants to reward you for it. I believe that we're going to be rewarded for things in glory that we think, really? Like, I never even thought of that. That was just such a small thing. It seemed so inconsequential. It seemed like it didn't matter. And Jesus says, no, it mattered because I saw your heart. I see what's in your heart when you do that. And that's exactly the kind of way I want to run my kingdom, both now and in the age to come. And so I love when you do that. I love the way you love other people. I love the way you love me, and I love the way you love the, the broken. I love the way you love the church. I love the way you love the lost. You know, and so it's a good, it's a good work. It really, really matters. And, and I believe that when we have confidence that our choices matter, that it'll, it'll really encourage us to make good choices. You know, if we think, well, nobody sees anyway, so what's the big deal? You know, I'm going to cheat on my taxes because who knows, you know? But when we, when we do the things in the secret places that we think nobody sees, the lights are off, the crowd's gone away, the applause has died down, and we still do what's right, God sees. He sees and he honors you for that. And I believe there's going to be eternal you know, weight of glory that's, that's going to be put on top of that. And so these rewards help keep us steady. It keeps us wholehearted, not just day for day. I believe even decade after decade because I, I, I want to live to 120. Wouldn't that be great? You know, I want to live for 120 in good health. In good mental mind, my eyes do not grow dim. I want to I continue to give. You know, I want to be wholehearted before the Lord until, until that long. And, and in the end, the general exhortation that Jesus gives to every church is he says, to him who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Did you know that that is actually written a total of 16 times in the Scriptures, spoken by Jesus, eight times in the Gospels, and eight times in the seven letters to the seven churches? Right? A total of 16 times. Eight times, sorry, eight times in Revelation. I think it's all in the seven letters. So, so we just need to remember that this is Jesus' church. And he wants a bride to rule the kingdom of God and the earth with, just like Adam was longing for a bride to rule over the Garden of Eden. It's a, it's a similar thing, just so much bigger. And he's coming back for a prepared bride who understands who he is, understands what he's about, and he understands what's happening on the earth during that time and during that season and that day and age, so that she knows who she's betrothed to. You know, if, if you look and you say, you know, that, I, I don't really like you, Jesus, well, you've got the right to sign off. If you're saying, I, I don't like this image of you, well, then you don't have to marry him. But if you really like him, if you really like who you see, it's going to warm your heart up. You're going to be so passionately in love with him as he comes back for an overcoming bride or an overcoming church. It's going to be absolutely awesome. And the last thing I want to say about this before we begin to, to break into it uh, in just a moment is that I believe knowing these seven letters will prepare you and I for the greatest revival the world's ever seen. I mean, more than in the early church, more than in the days of the apostles, 
more than in the days of Jesus. When we understand this, we're going to be we're going to be pouring ourselves out wholeheartedly, lives poured out for the glory of God. Because of love, we will give ourselves to, to Jesus' brothers. You know, we'll give himself to those that are lost, those that are broken. And when I think of his brothers, by the way, first of all, I think of Israel, and then I think of the rest of the world. Because Jesus was a Jewish man, and so that's one of the reasons we love Israel. Okay? It's because he was a Jewish man. He's going to come back as a Jewish man to reign from a Jewish city called Jerusalem, but he'll reign over the whole globe and over the whole continent. So that's why we pray for Israel. It's why we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you, the word says. And so we want to, I want to prosper. I don't know about you. I want to prosper spirit, soul, and body. You know, physically, financially, all those things. But in my soul and in my spirit that I'm fully alive in him. One last thing actually as well. So that's the second one last thing I'm telling you. And uh, that is, is that, the, that the scripture in the book of Revelation talks about the angel of the church of the different seven churches. So that word angel is actually the same word, angelos, that is referred to and translated messenger when it refers to John the Baptist. And so it is probable, in my estimation, that these letters are actually given to the messengers or to take that one step farther to the leaders or apostolic leaders over the churches because it's not an it's not jesus telling john to tell an angel to tell a church you understand it's jesus giving john the message john the the one whose heart was on his chest on his breast who knew intimacy who knew passion who knew destiny and desire to give it to the apostolic leader of the church of the city to tell them so that they in turn could turn around and tell the city as to what the Lord was looking for in the bride that was coming his way. And so uh, that's, that's awesome. So now, that said, let's go on and let's talk about Ephesus. By the way, I need to know the time on those things because I don't want to go over 1230 today because we have a concert tonight, right? I don't know how many are coming for the concert with Jesus, Jesus culture, Torwalt. 12 minutes. Okay, let's talk about the church of Ephesus. Give me a 12.25, five hand, minutes up, okay, unless I get to see them in there. So Ephesus was the first church that Jesus gave his letter to. And I find a lot of commonality with Ephesus. I don't want to say I find complete commonality with Ephesus, which will be obvious in a minute. But Ephesus was the third largest city in the ancient world. They had the greatest revival in the terms of the number of people touched, surpassing even Jerusalem. They, um, Jerusalem was actually the first city that you see in the early church that had a revival. The second was Antioch in Acts chapter 13, and the third was Ephesus. And uh, the, the revival in Ephesus surpassed the previous two. And so a few decades have passed since the, the crux or the very height of that revival. And Jesus says, John, I want you to go and tell Ephesus that I've got a few things to say to them. You know, so say 20, 30 years, I don't know how many years afterwards. And so it's like, you know, the crux of our revival was, I don't know, late 90s, early 2000s, where God came, poured out his spirit. And, and so it's good to have the Lord continue to communicate, right? How many like a bridegroom that communicates with you, actually talks to you a little bit? It's a good thing. And uh, so he says, I, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, right, he says, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the golden lampstands. And so Jesus is revealing this about himself. He's saying to this church of Ephesus, I'm the one who holds, who supports, directs, protects, and anoints you. You know, I walk in your midst. I'm intimate with you. I'm right here, and, and just like I hold the seven stars, I hold you in my hand. I mean, isn't it great to know that the Lord is even holding us in his hand? I believe he's holding us in his hand. He's there, he's holding us, he's directing us, he's protecting us. He's deeply involved with the church of Ephesus, even as I, I believe he is with us, because we've experienced it. And he goes on and he says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, or it can be translated perseverance, that you cannot bear those who are evil. You've tested those who say they're apostles and they are not, and you've found them liars. And so here's where Jesus is essentially speaking to the church of Ephesus, and he's telling them what a great job they've done. He's saying to them, you know, I know you work hard. I know you're diligent. I know you've applied yourself and you've given yourself wholeheartedly. I know your labor. I know your outreaches, that you're reaching out for the lost and the souls that are in the city. And, you know, well done. It's about your ministry. You're doing a great job. I know your patience or your perseverance, that 
Even though it's not easy in the culture around you, you guys are going for it. You're, you're, you're applying yourself. You're collectively coming together to reach out and to win those people and these souls in that place and in the midst of your outreach. And so well done that you're doing that. And then he goes on, I know you can't bear those that are evil. Well, one of the last things that the Apostle Paul spoke to the church in Ephesus was in Acts chapter 20, where he gathered the leaders together, and they wept together because of the intimacy that they had. And, and as they're, they're there and they're praying, and Paul is prophesying to them, he says, listen, I know that there's going to come a time when savage beasts are going to rise among you, bringing in false doctrines. Be aware of them. Watch out for them. And this letter to the church of Ephesus begins to tell us that that's exactly what they did. They paid heed to the prophetic word that Paul gave them 20 or so years ago, 15, 20 years ago. And they're doing what he asked them to do. So it's like, well done, Ephesus, for your work, your labor. You've done very well in that regard. And, uh, you know, it means that they're not giving in to any false message. They've got a heart for truth. They want the truth of God's word. They're not going to give in to any false grace message or false tolerance message. But sir, I, I believe in tolerance, but not tolerance with evil. You understand what I'm saying? There's differences in, in this. There's perversions in the things that come out. And so the Lord is saying to the church of Ephesus, you, you guys are actually speaking up when things are wrong. You're not being silent. You're not being, being passive. You're actually standing up against the evil that's taking place in your midst. And you're, founding, you're finding that those that are lying and are spreading false doctrines, you're, you're standing up to them and you're proving them wrong. And I'm proud of you for that. Well done. And how many would like that you know, for our church? Wouldn't that be great? It's like, God, only some of you will. I, I'd like it anyway. You know, and when again, apply this individually, right? Apply it to the church, but apply it individually. You've done well and that you're, you're not letting false doctrines come in and seep into your heart and in what you're doing. Well done for standing for truth. Well done when you take a hit for it, but you stand anyway. Well done when they persecute you for my name's sake, but you stand anyway. And then he goes on and he says, nevertheless... Like that word, nevertheless? <laughs> yeah. Or but, it depends on what you're looking for, you know, what version you're reading. But I have this against you, that you've abandoned the love you had at first, or you have, you know, you, you've, you've lost your first love. You've abandoned the love you had at first. Right? And then he goes on and he says, Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen. Repent and do the works that you did at first. Do the works you did at first. It's like you've forgotten your first love. It's like that's why, that's why I appreciate the messages that, that John and Carol have championed about buying oil. Yeah. Church, you know, we've got to buy oil. And, and if you bought oil last week, buy it this week. Yeah. Right? Buy it tomorrow. Buy it the day after. What does buy oil mean? Spend time in the place of intimacy. I'm feeling the longing in my own heart. You know, busyness captures us. I remember Carol Arnott talk and taught about being busy, B-U-S-Y, being under Satan's yoke. And I think that's a bit of a euphemism. It's a bit stretched at one level because there's a lot of really good works we're doing. Like God commended the church of Ephesus. Well done. You're working well. You're doing a great job. But let's just watch for the busyness. Let's watch for all the stuff because we, we need to have oil in our lamps. We need to realize that the ministry we carry, that there's a passionate love affair that drives it. It's not you... You know, just caught in a rut or caught in a, in a gerbil wheel, you know, hamster wheel, going around and around and around and around and around. And so he's saying, you've lost your first love. And he goes on, he says, remember, therefore, from where you've fallen. Repent, do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and I will remove your lampstand from your place unless you repent. And so what the Lord is saying is, Remember how you used to relate to me. Remember those days in the height of the revival where I would come and I would meet with you and you would spend time on the floor. And I would, I would come and we would have such an intimate time and you thought it was 10 minutes and it was two hours. Remember those times where we had such intimacy and our love affair was passionate and hot. And there's anything, there's nothing that you wouldn't do for me. You know, and, and you served me because you loved me. Now you serve me because you've got a popular ministry or you've got a, you know, it's just the grind that you're in and you've lost your passion. You've lost the heartbeat. You're disconnected from my heart and the things that you're doing. Remember how we interacted. I want you to rekindle that passion and that love back in your heart once again. And I want you to remember 
that vision. I want you to re-engage, set time aside. Look at your schedule and begin to think about the things that really aren't feeding your spirit and begin to carve time that feeds your spirit. And he says, then repent. Turn away from the way that you're living now. Repent means, first of all, change the way you think. Then it means change your actions, change, the, change your mind, change the way you do things. And then he says, act. I, I want you to, to do something about it. Change the way you think, but then begin to change the way you live. Spend, spend your time, your money, your energy back on the things that you did when we were at the very height of our, the very height of our love relationship. And maybe that's a good word for natural marriages as well. Right? Maybe it's time to say, hey, let's have a, let's have a fifth honeymoon. Yeah. Right? Let's just go. Let's do that, that fifth honeymoon. Let's begin to do the things that we're not all about success on the outward, but we're into that inner journey that we talk about where we come alive. And so, but then the Lord says, if you don't, if you don't, I will come and I'll remove your lampstand. I mean, this is so near to the heart of Jesus for what he's looking for in his church. He says, I'm actually going to, I'll actually pull your church up from you. I'll actually remove your church. It's like, shut it down. Does that sound harsh? I mean, I think it's like, God, what are we, in, what are we doing this for? You know, let's not get the cart before the horse. Let's remember it's the great commandment as the foundation. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we only love him because he first loved us. But then on top of it, it's the great commission. If you try to do the great commission without the great commandment, you're going to burn out. And I don't want to see that all of our works get burned up because of, you know, because we lost our first love. So now the good news is, catch the fire, I don't believe that's our problem right now, at least not corporately. The way you worshiped this morning was incredible, right? The way you're just going for it and loving up on Jesus, loving up on your bridegroom, absolutely awesome, incredible, and keep up the good work. But understand that that's what he's looking for and longing for, and everything else is built and based upon that. So let's, uh, let's stand, and I want us to pray that that fire of love will continue to burn in our hearts. Right, that there's a burning that takes place that really gets us going. The next, next week, we're going to, Lord willing, we're going to talk about the next five or different aspects of the next five and the things that the Lord wants. But let's just raise up our hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for that fire of our first love to be rekindled. Lay your hands on somebody next to you. God, rekindle that fire. Burn that fire. God, bring us back to our first love. Bless natural marriages and let us see who you are. That we have a bridegroom that longs for us to be wholehearted and, and we want Jesus to please you with all of our hearts, our mind, our soul, our strength in love. Rekindle that love. Rekindle that passion. Burn it deep in our hearts in Jesus' name. God, we want to be, be counted as those that you commend for works of righteousness. But above that, you commend us because we're passionate, that we're burning on the inside, roaring like a lion. God, longing and yearning and burning for your return, Jesus. We love you with all of our hearts. Lord, increase the revelation upon us of how much you first loved us. In Jesus' name. Oh, yes. Can we have a CD playing? No, I want you to just bless one another. Keep praying for one another in that regard. If there's anybody here today that does not know Jesus, you can come forward. We'd love for you to come. And we want to introduce you to the lover of your soul to your bridegroom God and King, the one who gave himself for you and that, that deeply longs for and yearns for an intimate walk with you. I urge you, don't leave this place if you don't know him, but come forward because we want to introduce you to him. Likewise, anybody that's on the internet, if you're watching, I'm gonna pray a prayer and just urge you to repeat after me. Jesus, come into my heart. I confess my sin. And I confess that my heart has been cold. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me and wash me. And fill me with your hot, fiery love. In Jesus' name, amen. And if that's you, if you've just prayed that prayer, or know that you need that recommitment to your first love, I wanna welcome you even, you know, apart from praying for one another, come to the front. Let's just do business with the Lord at the altar, that you ask him to rekindle your heart, to burn deep within, to rekindle that passion in Jesus' name. God bless you all. Have a great week.